if we go to the agenda and then actually after the closure of the address, <coughs> I'll go through the order, orders of proceedings for you all. Okay. So apologies for absence. Yes, Chair, we've had an apology from Councillor Ali. Um, he has been placed today by Councillor Hayley. Uh, number two, declosure of interests. Uh, yes, Chair, uh, I know Councillor Shotton and I also uh, know his wife uh, uh, does some work for me with her firm and I've been told by the legal department that makes me ineligible to sit on this committee. So I'm now withdrawing at this point. Okay, thank you. Um, and I to declare that I know Paul Shotton on a professional basis as a, a member of the council. Um, likewise, I'd like to declare the same that I know as a councillor. Um, I'd like to declare that I know Paul Shotton, obviously, he's a member of the Labour Party, Calvin Mendeberg, and also know Paul Shotton, the competitors. Myself, because I'm a councillor. Thank you. Okay, the order of proceedings today, first of all we'll have, uh, if I'll introduce everybody, I'm Chair, Councillor Anne James. Um, on my left hand side I've got Councillor Dutton, Councillor Hamer, the independent um, uh, person who we have um, is Mrs Joan Carr, she's here on an advisory capacity, um, on my right hand side I've got Councillor Napper, we've also got our monitoring officer which is Catherine Parkinson, and our Democratic Services representative here is Andrew Garner, and um, we have Jerry Clark, who is the investigating officer. Okay. And the meeting is to determine an alleged breach of member con code of conduct by Councillor Paul Shotton, and that's what we're here to discuss today. Um, We've had notification, I think, that um, unfortunately... Yeah, Councillor Shatton does not intend to appear today. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to, uh, to move that we actually, because of the expediency, that we actually uh, carry on the committee in his absence. For the same reason, I'd like to second that proposal. Can we take a vote? So, if we can actually, um, what what will happen is, for your information, um, first of all, we'll hear the presentation of the case by the investigating officer. <coughs> Um, he will actually explain the nature of the complaints and put forward his investigation. Um, the panel members can then ask relevant questions of the investigation officer. Um, there will be a closing submission by ourselves, but what's happening is normally we ask people to leave the room but when we're going to discuss the closing submission, actually, what will happen is we will go into closed agenda, so we will be leaving the room instead of asking yourselves to leave the room. If that's okay with everybody. So then I hand it over to our officer, Jerry Clark, to present the evidence. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, and members of the panel, the facts of this case are not in dispute. Over, over a period of six months, commencing on the 19th of December 2013 and ending on the 29th of May 2014, Councillor Shotton sent 15 text messages under various alias aliases to a Radio Stoke debate programme in support of the Council and its policies and criticising opposition councillors. 
The matter was first reported by the BBC and subsequently by the Evening Sentinel on the 29th of May 2014. And in an article headed City Deputy Paul Shot Suspended by Labour over phony text to Radio Stoke. At the time the matter was reported to the council, um, Councillor Shotton was the ward councillor for the Fenton East Ward of the City Council. He was a cabinet member for economic development and he was deputy leader of the City Council. Councillor Shotton has admitted sending the text from his own personal mobile phone and in the statement issued to the Sentinel on the 29th of May 2014, and which is reported in the article referred to, Councillor Shotton apologised fully for his actions. Madam Chair, you have within your pack a transcript of each of the texts, and those appear um, at Appendix 1, uh, Document 1. <coughs> As you can see, the text fall broadly into three categories. Firstly, those that comment positively on City Council policies, such as the benefit of council housing over the private rented sector, the need for a HS2 station in Stoke-on-Trent, and the Council's decision to exhibit at Chelsea Flower Show. The second category of texts are those that comment negatively on the proposal for a Town Council for Fenton. And the third group of texts are those that comment negatively on opposition councillors and opposition policies. And at this point, in the absence of Councillor Shotton, Councillor Shotton has quite correctly um, identified uh, that there is no direct criticism of uh, opposition policies within, uh, within the text. And so therefore, paragraph C should be amended to read those that comment negatively on opposition councillors rather than opposition councillors and opposition uh, policies. Turning to the relevant legislation and the provisions within the code, the Localism Act 2011 introduced fundamental changes to the regulations of standards of conduct for elected and co-opted members. Under section 27 of the Act, a relevant authority of which the Council is one must promote and maintain high standards of conduct by its members and co-opted members and when discharging its duty, <coughs> adopt a voluntary code dealing with the conduct that is expected of members and co-opted members of the authority when they are acting in a capacity as members, <coughs> that is when they are acting in an official capacity. At its meeting of the 27th of July 2012, the Council adopted a revised Members' Code and the relevant provisions are set out in paragraphs 2.6 uh, to 2.10 of my report and I'll briefly summarise those. Paragraph 1 of the Code makes it clear that the Code applies to all members of the Authority and paragraph 2 of the Code makes it clear that the code applies whenever <coughs> members act in their official capacity. That is when mem members conduct the business of the authority, which includes the business of the office, uh, which the member is elected or appointed, or they act, claim to act, or give the impression that they are acting as a representative of the authority. I think key to this investigation is that the code does not have effect in relation to conduct undertaken by a member in a purely private <coughs> capacity unless that activity has a link with the, with the functions of the member's office. <coughs> Therefore, in order for there to be a breach of the code, a member must be acting in an official <coughs> capacity. The first issue I, I therefore must have considered and must determine is, or this panel must determine, is whether Councillor Shotton was acting in an official capacity when he sent the text to Radio Stoke. This is a complicated area of law, and the High Court considered the matters that could be covered by the Code in October 2016 in the case of Livingstone versus the Adjudication Panel for England. 
In this case, the Mayor of London, Ken Livingstone, had been referred to the adjudication panel by an ethical standards officer over comments he made to, to an evening standard journalist after a dinner. The ESO alleged that Mr Livingstone had been in breach of the equivalent provisions to paragraph 5 of the Council's Code. An amendment in that a member must not act in his official capacity or in any uh, other circumstance, conduct himself in a manner which could reasonably be regarded as bringing his office or authority into disrepute. The panel found that while Mr Livingstone was not acting in an official capacity, he had breached that provision. In the High Court, Mr Livingstone <coughs> argued that the effect of Section 52 of the Local Government Act 19, sorry, 2000, which is the duty to comply with the Code of Conduct, was to prevent the Code from, over, from covering activities which were carried out in a member's private life. Mr Justice Collins found that whilst the Code of Conduct could extend to a member's acts outside an official capacity, those acts had to be in performing his functions and any other circumstances in that case was to be construed narrowly. The law has um, developed since the, Le the Livingstone case and in the case of uh, Banbrook, full statements have been made by a councillor in a video which were posted on the internet. In this case, the tribunal found the video to be a party uh, broadcast and in relation to the question of whether the appellant in that case was conducting the, the business of the authority, it referred to the judgment of Mr Justice Charles <coughs> in Milani versus the adjudication panel for England. <coughs> in that case, it was stated, and it's a key test, the most relevant part of the definition here is conducts the business of the office to which he or she has been elected or appointed. These are ordinary descriptive English words. Their application is inevitably fact sensitive and so whether or not a person is acting um, inevitably calls for informed judgment by reference to the facts of a given case. This also means that there is potential for, do, for two decision makers both taking the correct approach to reach different decisions. And I said that's a key, um, a key decision insofar as um, you are to apply the test set out in the case against the facts of the case. Further guidance can now be found in, in a further judgment um, in the in MC versus Standards Committee of the London Borough of Richmond. In that case, which concerned the member sending out emails, Mr Justice Ward said, the test under paragraph 21A in their particular code is whether the appellant was a matter in the ordinary course of English language actually conducting the business of the authority, including the business of the office to which he'd been appointed. Further, when one is acting as a representative of the authority, is therefore a matter for determination by the tribunal of fact, in this case the Standards Committee, or on appeal in the first tier tribunal. I do have to consider that reading the model code as a whole, it's evident that representative not to be equated to member. The model code uses both terms and must be taken to have done so deliberately. Accordingly, merely to act, claim to act, or give the impression that one is acting as a member is, in Mr Justice Ward's view, not of itself sufficient unless there is material on which the tribunal of fact can properly conclude that the member was acting as a representative of the authority. I realise that that is a particularly um, but important series of judgments. Paraphrasing, the question can therefore properly be construed as being was Councillor Shotton conducting the business of the authority or acting as a representative of the authority when he sent the text to Radio Stoke? <clears throat> As I previously said, the text can be broadly grouped into three types. Those that comment positively on council business, those that comment <coughs> negatively on the proposal for a town council for Fenton, 
and those that comment negatively on opposition councillors. There's no doubt in my mind that had Councillor Shotton said the text in his own name, he would have been perceived by listeners to the Radio Stoke programme to have been representing the authority as a senior member of the Cabinet and as Deputy Leader of the Council. However, there is an important but subtle distinction between the public perception of when a member is acting in an official capacity and when in fact in law the member is actually acting in an official capacity. Text of the type referred to in paragraph 4.8a, i.e. those that relate directly to council business, uh, as I said, relates specifically to decisions taken by the authority, all of which Councillor Shotton had been involved in, either as a spokesman for the council or as part of the cabinet. And it's clear to me that under the principle of collective cabinet responsibility, the functions of a council, of a council cabinet member include the promotion and defence of the council and its policies and its decisions. I'm therefore of the opinion that if Councillor Shotton had sent the texts, uh, uh, those type of texts, um, in his own name to the Radio Stoke programme, there would be no doubt he would have been perceived by the general public and in fact in law acting in an official capacity. Texts of the type referred to in paragraph 4.8b, i.e. those commenting negatively on the proposal for uh, Fenton Town Council, are more problematic in that they do not specifically promote or defend council policies or council decisions or any decision previously taken by the authority. Councillor Shotton has helpfully referred me to the case of Ben Rowan, a Bournemouth councillor, who in 2009 had posted comments praising himself and fellow councillors on a local newspaper website under the pseudonym Amiga Man. In this case, the Standards Board for England found that Councillor Growing was not, Councillor Grower was not acting in an official capacity and the Code of Conduct did not apply. In its decision letter, Standards for England stated, in writing under another name for a newspaper, Councillor Grower was not con conducting the business of the authority or his office. The code applies to members when they conduct the business of their authority. Madam Chair and members of the panel, I find this decision entirely consistent with the decisions of Mr Justice Charles in Milani and Mr Justice Ward in the London Borough of Richmond. Following the decision in the Richmond case, Standards for England issued a statement to the effect that decisions could have significant ramifications for, ramification for <coughs> members um, when they um, undertake activity on blogs, Twitter and other internet sites. And in that statement they stated it is unlikely that most blogs or etc. postings will contain content that holds a member out to be acting as a representative of the authority rather than simply as a member, unless that content in, in some way gives the impression that the member is speaking for the council. However, depending on the circumstances, such communications might be regarded as conducting the business of the, of the authority or of the office of the member. This is because it is reasonable to regard communicating with constituents at large about issues of local political interest as being part of the business of the office of a councillor. <coughs> Chair, I'm firmly of the view that the ongoing governance review and the proposal for a town council for Fenton is an issue of local political interest. And on balance, by commenting on, upon it, Councillor Shotton would, if he'd sent the text in his own name as the local ward councillor, have been acting in an official capacity. Text of the type referred to in paragraph 4.8c, i.e. those criticising opposition councillors, do not relate specifically to the council's policies or to decisions previously taken by the authority, nor can they be construed as communications to constituents at large about matters of local political interest. And therefore, on balance, I do not believe that the texts referred to in paragraph 4.8c above 
<coughs> during the remit of the Code of Conduct. Having come to this conclusion, I must now consider whether by sending texts of the types referred to in paragraphs A and B, i.e. those which relate to council business <coughs> or to matters of local political interest, under various aliases from his private mobile phone, um, does this mean that Councillor Shot was no longer acting in an official capacity? And in his defence, Councillor Shotton argues the use, of locally, the use locally of pseudonyms is very prolific on local blog sites and the main newspaper sites. <clears throat> Virtually all post, uh, posters post under an alias or a pseudonym. I agree with Councillor Shotton that the use of aliases or pseudonyms is, is common and in certain cases appropriate. <clears throat> However, it's usually apparent when such aliases or pseudonyms are being used. In the circumstances, I do not consider that the use of an alias or a pseudonym by a member of the council's executive to comment on council policies or council business would have been or is appropriate. To accept such an argument would mean that members would be able to act with impunity and to breach the code of conduct without fear of recourse. Finally on this point, I do not consider that the fact that texts were sent by Councillor Shotton from his private mobile phone to be material. It's well established that official information held in private email accounts or in texts on private mobile phones may be the subject of disclosure requirements of the Freedom of Information Act if it relates to the business of the authority. Having concluded that Councillor Shotton was acting <coughs> in an official capacity, when he sent the text to the radio stoke, I must now consider the content of the individual texts and whether the content of any of the texts is defamatory, disrespectful or otherwise in breach of the code. As I stated previously, the texts support council policies and its decisions and oppose or criticise opposition points of uh, opposition councillors. This, in my opinion, is the normal course of business of a local authority. Having considered the content of the text, I do not consider that the content of any of them is either defamatory, disrespectful, or otherwise in breach of the code. Councillor Conway, the complainant, disagrees with my interpretation and believes that one of the texts in particular has damaged his reputation as leader of the opposition. The text in question was sent on the 21st of March uh, 2014 and states, can't believe Councillor Dave Conway, where do we get these people? The text was sent anonymously. For the reasons set out in, in uh, previously in my report, on balance, I do not believe that when Councillor Scotland sent this te text, he was acting in an official capacity and therefore, hypothetically speaking, even if the content of the text had damaged Councillor Con Conway's reputation, which I do not believe it does, it would fall outside the, re the remit of the Code of Conduct. Finally, having concluded that Councillor Shotton was acting in an official capacity when he sent certain of the texts, but that the content of those texts are not defamatory, disrespectful, or breach the Code of Conduct, I must now consider whether by sending those texts under various aliases, Councillor Shotton could reasonably be regarded as bringing his office or authority into disrepute. In deciding whether the misconduct complained of could reasonably be regarded as bringing his office or authority into disrepute, it is not sufficient simply for the misconduct to damage the reputation of the individual. At the time Councillor Shotton, Councillor Shotton sent the text, he was cabinet member for economic development and the deputy leader of the council. At all material times, <coughs> Councillor Shotton held a very senior position within the authority and as such, his conduct was under very considerable scrutiny. In his defence, Councillor Shotton states that his motivation for sending these texts was the incessant negativity demonstrated by local media generally, which appears to be constantly trying to present and perpetuate a negative image of the city and in particular the City Council. He further states that it was not his intention to mislead the listeners of the, of the Radio Stoke programme 
just to present what he believed to be a balanced view and a more positive perspective of the city and the city council. I must say at this point I have some sympathy for Councillor Shotton and I can understand his and other council colleagues' frustration in getting their point and their message over to the public. However, regrettably I am of the opinion that despite his intentions, his actions did mislead the public who may have had a different view on the matters had Councillor Shot and sent the text in his own name. Accordingly, I am of the opinion that in sending the text to Radio Stoke under various aliases, Councillor Shot has, <coughs> has not only damaged his own reputation, he has damaged the reputation of the cabinet on which he served and the position of deputy leader of the council. And for the reasons above, I find that in this instance, the complaint made by Councillor Conway is upheld in part, and that Councillor Shotton's actions have brought both his office and the authority into disrepute. And then, Chair, unless you have any questions. Thank you. Councillor Shotton. Yeah. Um, in, in, in your statement, Jerry, you say it's his personal, personal mobile phone. Now, I mean, I have my personal own, my own personal mobile phone, which I use for council business as well as private business, and I get an allowance for that phone, uh, which to me makes it, um, how can I say, um, an official phone while I'm using that phone, if I'm using it for any, anything to do with the council. Does Councillor Shotton have a separate phone that is supplied by the council, or like me, as an allowance for that phone? I'm, I'm not aware of that council, but I couldn't say either way. I don't know. Oh. I think it's a, it's a very thin line, um, obviously 4.9, you, you say you conclude that Council Shot was acting in an official capacity, but from the authorities' perspective, was he acting in an official capacity, or is it perception that, you know, from the public's eyes he was acting in that capacity because obviously you know it's, it's, it's divided if he was acting on behalf of the authority or acting on his own on his, on his own instincts or it's the perception what people would get wouldn't it? because there, there is a I think there's a defined between the two and the real uh council the only thing I can say in that is that the um, I have tried to set out in the report the um, the legal test to be applied to yeah. determine whether or not a member is acting in an official capacity. Um, and as I said early um, in, the, in, the, um, in the report, it is fact sensitive. Um, there is a, a, a fine line between when a member is acting in an official capacity uh, and when they're acting in a purely personal capacity. In my view and in my opinion and my analysis, um, at the times that Councillor, sorry, Councillor uh, shot and sent the texts, um, he was acting in an official capacity as the, the, the legal test applies to, <coughs> to those type of texts relating to council business and to yeah. local po local politi uh, political interest. Yeah, I understand that, but what I'm trying to get at is what he was saying is not an official statement from the authority. There's a, there's a separate sort of line. Um, so it's difficult to determine it because it's not what he said is not official and what you know, he was doing on his own but obviously perceived. I think I think that when, when members accept the office of um, councillor, um, there there are two there are two things. Firstly, are, do the public perceive them to be making statements on behalf of the authority? And secondly, is that member actually representing the authority at the time they made the texts. And I said earlier in my report there's a subtle distinction between the two. In my, in my view and in my analysis, um, there, is a, there is a fine line, but unfortunately um, when you apply the tests set out in the report, uh, in my opinion, Councillor Shotton was acting in official capacity. Okay, thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Jerry. Um, it is noted in your report um, that the use of pseudonyms by a member of the council's executive, um, specifically to comment on council policies or business, to be inappropriate. 
Um, the, your report also notes that the texts under question are not defamatory or disrespectful or otherwise in breach of the code of conduct. That's a direct quote from the report. I'd like to know um, specifically um, whether the Bournemouth case, the recent case on the 2nd of September, is substantively different from this case, and if so, in what way? In, in, the, in the Bournemouth case, which unfortunately, um, I suppose fortunately for Councillor Grower, um, but, but unfortunately for lawyers, um, did not go to the High Court, it was not appealed. So all we have is the decision letter from the Standards Board and in that particular case, there is a clear distinction between um, messages and texts and blogs, uh, which effectively praise a member and praise the work of that member, or even um, go so far as being a um, political um, campaign is concerned, um, or party political campaign is concerned, and in those cases, I feel it's quite, quite right. Those are not members acting in their official capacity. What you have to do is link the, um, the subject matter to the business of the authority. Um, and, in, and in that particular case, Councillor Grove was not conducting the business of the authority. He was merely praising himself and his, and his fellow councillors. Any other questions? Yes, and um, briefly, um, just a question regarding what could be considered as a value judgment. Um, specifically, um, the report states that it is well established that official information held in private email accounts or in text or in private mobile phones may be subject to disclosure requirements. I think it may be clear to lawyers and perhaps a number of us in this room and indeed some others, but I don't yes. think it necessarily is the case that um, it is well established to all lay people, and I include lay people, that, who may be counsellors. I, I absolutely agree, and I've probably used lawyers' terminology in that, in that respect. It's a well established fact of law, yes. or a principle of law. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just ask a question? Um, has actually Council Sharpen actually taken undertaken the training on the, the, the standards? All members receive or, or are offered training. Um, it's, I can't specifically say whether or not Council Sharpen has undertaken this um, standards training, but it is offered to all. Andrew, could you help on that? Um, unfortunately, no chair, um, which isn't our team, who actually deal with the training. I think on, period and on previous meetings we have a reporter who's supposed to have undertaken the training. It is offered to everyone. Yeah. No other questions? No? Thank you very much for the report. I appreciate all the hard work that actually you have undertaken on the Hebrew Park. Um, um, what we will do now is actually retire and actually into the other room and discuss actually the report. Thank you. Do you want to make any closing submission before we go no, and make thank a decision? You. No, I think no. But thank you very much for your report. It's very much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We've um, I'm going to read out the findings. Um, I'd like it noted that actually it was a unanimous decision by the panel that, having heard the evidence presented by the investigating officer and read the submissions of Councillor Paul Shotton, the panel have determined that the complaint made by Councillor Conway is upheld in part. Councillor Shotton actions could be perceived as acting in an official capacity and could be reasonably regarded as bringing his office or authority into disrepute. 
Um, before we go any further, um, can I invite the investigation um, officer, if you've got any other comments that you would like to make, please. Um, I have no comments in respect of your decision. Um, are you inviting me to comment on a proposed sanction? Yes, please. Um, you've been advised of the range of sanctions that you, that you have and that you can impose as a panel. Personally and professionally, I believe um, that Councillor Shotton has paid an extremely high price uh, for his actions, uh, which he has stated were meant with, with the best intention. In that respect, I believe that Councillor Shotton's misdemeanours fall within the uh, bottom range of the pot of possible sanctions that you could impose. And to that extent, I would consider a reprimand or a censure as being um, an appropriate sanction and possibly, possibly the uh, a further referral for additional training. Okay. According to the procedure, this is why we're where we actually leave the room again and we discuss actually what's been proposed. Okay. Okay, it's been agreed that the sanctions that are available to the panel um, I don't know if you've all got a copy of what sanctions we can take. No. Okay. Uh, number one um, is censure and reprimand the member. We have to publish the findings in respect of the member's conduct and a report of the findings will go to the council for information. And it's been re recommended by the panel that a recommendation to the leader that the member holds no chair and is in the, in the, or cabinet position for the remainder of the municipal year. Um, we're also instructing the, the monitoring officer to arrange training for the member and that is more or less all the powers that we've got as a committee that we can actually impose. So you will get a full report of the findings will actually be published and um, we just thank everybody for attending. Okay, thank you. I've had a few hours to digest what went on today. Um, it's been a bit difficult. I do feel that we've been taken for a ride yet again, and I don't blame the chair. I don't necessarily blame the committee, although it was heavily stacked in Councillor Shotton's favour. I do think that the procedures need to be looked at. I don't have all the details, obviously, but I do think they need to be looked at so that Councillor Shotton, and anybody else for that matter, who's under that kind of scrutiny, can be charged with something more serious. Because it seems to me that no matter what he did, all he was ever going to get was a slap on the wrist, and that's what's happened today. Now, I understand that the Labour Party, and by that I mean the regional office, I understand that they're conducting an inquiry as well. But because he's been with the Labour Party a very long time, and he's a trusted member of the Cabinet in Stoke, and by all accounts, Councillor Pervez is the one that really wants him around... I can't see anything more happening other than, well, you know, you've been a bad lad, don't do it again. The worst part about it, I think, is that he's got to undergo extra training. Now, this training, we understand, is available to all, but it's not compulsory. Now, if you're going to be a counsellor, particularly in, in the, the modern age where multimedia and social media and all the other things that are going on, you need to know what you're doing. You really need to know what you're doing. He's very well aware of tweeting and of texting and all the other things. It doesn't seem that far removed to me to have a little bit of training with the actual technical aspects of things, but by using your common flipping sense. Really, a man of his experience, a man of his years, a man of his years and experience in office to, to have risen to the, 
the role of deputy leader, you would have thought that he knew what he was doing. You would have thought that he knows the difference between right and wrong. You would have thought that he would have had the common sense to use a different phone. You would have thought that everything that he did was planned. I'd like to say naive, but it's not naive. It was planned. And anybody who says differently, really, needs to look at the definition of subterfuge, because that is what's going on. I do believe that the council has had a rough ride, and that I have to accept that I've been part of that rough ride, but they are elected to represent us. They are elected to do the very, very best for the whole city. And when I say the whole city, I don't just mean the infrastructure. I don't mean the buildings and the business and the CBD and if they wanted to call it the Smithfield. And I don't mean HS2 and I don't mean all the other things that come with being part and parcel of his job. I mean the people. And to me, he hasn't represented the people of his ward. He hasn't represented the people of the city. He's merely represented his own little cabal of let's get our own way. And I know that's probably a jaundiced view and anybody watching this will say, oh, hang on, Alan. But that's the truth. The truth is that just a small number of people want what he wants. The vast majority of the people that I speak to and all right, I don't know all the city, but the vast majority of the people that I speak to don't want what he wants. We've been presented with a fait accompli. We're, we're regarding the vision for the city's future. We've been presented with lies. And, and I hate to use that term, but it is. It's their lies about who supports their vision. Council Shorten, what did he say? He said and not these exact words, but, but paraphrasing him, there would have been so much negative press about the council and its plans and etc, etc, that he wanted to redress the balance. That was basically it. If the public was behind the assorted schemes and white elephants and nonsense that, that the council had been putting forward in the last 12 months, there would have been no need for him to have redressed the balance. Because there would have been balance people would have been ringing up and saying, we think it's a good idea. That, that Alan Barrett is an idiot. But they didn't. Person after person after person who texted in, who rang in, they all said, this is not a good idea. And by this, I would, must emphasise that we were talking in a specific instance with the Chelsea Flower Show. But there are so many other things where the council's wasted money. Where the white elephant schemes that they dream up that don't cost them a single penny but they cost us and they will cost our grandchildren because these debts are long long term all these things that were put together the public has got no confidence and he's saying he's blaming the sentinel he's blaming radio stoke possibly signal radio i honestly don't know but basically he's saying the media is against us. I can't say that's true. When Councillor Shorten was forced to resign, he was a little bit on page 19 of the Sentinel. That's hardly the media having a go at him. This meeting today is in tonight's Sentinel and I think it's on page four. It's certainly not front page headlines. Sadly, the front page headlines today are something very, very tragic. These meetings that go on behind closed doors, and that nobody bothers to report, nobody bothers to, to, what's the word I'm looking for? Dig. Nobody bothers to dig for these stories. And yet, everybody knows they're there. I've been called a cynic, and I probably am. I've been called a conspiracy theorist. Uh, I'm not sure that I agree with that. But nothing that I have said is untrue. I don't make speculation. I ask some awkward questions. 
but nothing I've said is untrue. I'm not trying to deceive anybody. I'm not in a position to deceive anybody. I'm just one person. But I don't want this city that I love, where I live and I work, where I pay council tax to, I don't want this city run by people who tell me lies. And I don't think you should want that either. Today's proceedings were farcical, really. The only sanction that was available was a slap on the wrist. Now, if he knew that, he could do it again. Ask yourself, are these the kind of people you want in charge of the city? I'm not telling you who to vote for or who to vote against. I'm saying that these are the kind of questions you should be asking any potential candidate, no matter what party they stand for. Are you going to be honest? Are you going to be the kind of person I'd be proud to walk down the street with and be seen shaking hands with in public? I don't think you'd say that about Councillor Shotton. Sad though that is. How was that, mate? Lovely. I just made that up as I went along. Yeah, good, good. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I don't. Uh, I don't. I'm not slagging the man off. I don't. I don't because.